Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Ash Whitener, and this is episode 34, How to Create a Profitable Bitcoin Wallet, with our guest, Dmitry Morazchek, Project Manager for the Mycelium Bitcoin Wallet. Mycelium is a Bitcoin company which provides mobile wallets for both Android and iOS. It's one of the most developed and most popular wallets on the market. Recently, Mycelium raised over 5,000 Bitcoin, or over 2 million US dollars, in a crowd sale to fund future development, which will be used to create a wallet API framework in hopes to becoming the go-to wallet for both Bitcoin users and Bitcoin companies interested in developing financial applications. Basically, you can install apps in your Bitcoin wallet, just like on your cell phone. We begin with Dimitri's journey through computer science to becoming a financial analyst to finally merging his two passions by working for Mycelium. This is a very timely interview as the success of the Mycelium crowd sale has been heavily covered in the Bitcoin press. I hope you enjoy learning about the future of cryptocurrencies and token sales and how it could greatly disrupt the traditional stock and IPO offers. Last but not least, please rate us on iTunes. Links in the show notes. It really helps. Also, subscribe to our weekly newsletter to receive all new podcast updates delivered directly to your email inbox. You can go right to our homepage, libertyentrepreneurs.com, and sign up. Please follow us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes are found on our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com, and I hope you enjoy the show. With me today is Dmitry Moraschek. He is the project manager at Mycelium Wallet, which is a Bitcoin wallet you can download on your phone. Dmitry, thank you so much. Nice to uh, be here. So give us a quick background on who you are and just fill in the gaps a little bit. I'm Dmitry. My online nickname is uh, Rasa, R-A-S-S-A-H. That's usually how I go by online. Um, I'm one of those unfortunate very early internet users where I created an online nickname identity that was supposed to be totally different from my personal life to keep them separate and my online became a lot more famous and well known than my real one. So I kind of got stuck with that name since then. My background is I used to be a software developer a long, long time ago. I used to work for McDonald's Corporation as their IT manager for a bit, Uh, but since the dot-com bubble things kind of went down. Finding a developer job back then was a little more difficult, and I found out that I had an interest in finance. So since then, I switched to finance, got an education, a couple of degrees in it, and has been working as a financial analyst and, I guess, a business consultant since then. So I know that you work for Mycelium now. How did you learn about Mycelium, or how did you become a part of their team, and what's your role there? So I used to work for the government as a senior financial analyst for the Department of Housing uh, for Maryland State. A government job is generally about two to three hours of work a day uh, out of the eight or so. So the rest of the time to waste time, I just hung out on Reddit, Bitcoin talk forums, stuff like that. Uh, That's about the time that I found out about Bitcoin. And just from me kind of posting a lot, talking to a lot of people, building up a reputation, I uh, started a couple of, um, well, I helped out on a couple of projects back then. Um, I got a good enough reputation that when Mycelium started looking for a community manager, they ended up actually putting up a job as me in mind. And when I found it, they hired me right away. Uh, so that was back in January 2014. And what is a community manager from for Mycelium? What were the responsibilities or role? A brand manager who would kind of develop the brand. Uh, somebody would post on all the uh, social media, kind of make announcements for any kind of new releases, answer any kind of questions, and also any kind of uh, tech support questions. So that was my job as well. Basically, promote the brand. But that's different than what your role is now. You're more of a project manager. How did that transition happen? So... Initially, as a community manager, I was a community manager for the entire company as a whole. 
and mycelium uh, which was set up way back in 2008 actually has a whole lot of different products that they're working on uh, so my job was to promote all of them which meant that i actually had to know everything about all the mycelium products as well as knew, know what the progress and development is in all the projects and while kind of keeping and learning uh, keeping track of them and learning about them i found out that some of them needed some resources that other projects already had so i would coordinate between the teams uh, trying to set up where ways when we can share resources and um, there wasn't a lot of communication between the teams back then so after a while I kind of got frustrated and just saw that this was a job that somebody really really needs to step in and take care of so I requested to become instead of a community manager to kind of move myself into the product manager job Basically, like, hey, I'm going to hire myself as a product manager, so let's take care of this stuff. Yeah, well, it's very entrepreneurial for you to see where capital is not being allocated where it should be, or where you can use capital in multiple places and and start, you know, defining the products or defi- better defining uh, certain projects that you're working on within a company. Especially seeing that that wasn't necessarily your role; it was just something that you were interested in and you were good at. So that's yeah. uh, it. Seems like you had this entrepreneurial spirit that you weren't able to necessarily use in the community manager role and yeah. you know the entrepreneur wants to build and that's exactly what you did yeah in the last couple of positions i've been in i basically just hired myself i mean work a lot build up a reputation and just say okay you guys need this fixed i'm gonna step in and fix it and they're just like okay <laughs> so. if you can fix it fix it yeah a couple of weeks ago you guys had a big press release about a uh, quote radical upgrade coming to the mycelium wallet and I've seen some products starting to become available in the MyCelium wallet over time. The HD wallets, which change your uh, Bitcoin addresses for additional privacy. Uh, you've integrated Coinapult locks, which allows you to have Bitcoin in the wallet and quickly lock it to, uh, to a U.S. dollar price to hedge against the volatility. What, and now it seems that you're building some type of platform where you have called yourself or you'd like to be the Apple app store of the crypto finance world. What does that mean and what are you guys building? Well, initially, uh, we started out building a wallet as, I mean, our core kind of culture in the company is we want to promote uh, financial privacy. Uh, we are fairly open about being kind of anarchists in our entire company, including our CEO. So um, we started building that, but the wallet became pretty popular and we had a lot of third parties or companies starting to ask us because of our popularity of our wallet to implement their own services uh, directly into it. So this would be the coin pulled locks, uh, Cashilla, which lets anybody spend money to, uh, send money to a SEPA account in Europe. Uh, we had our own local trader. Um, we just came out with Gladera this week as well, which is like Coinbase is built directly into your wallet as well. Uh, the problem is that every, because of the way the wallet is set up <coughs> or designed, anytime somebody wants to uh, add their own feature, they have to come to us. Uh, we have to evaluate whether it's worth it. And if we think it, it might be worth it, we have to sit one of our own developers to actually start writing it from scratch, which takes up uh, anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of months of our own time and resources. And at the same time, we can't really focus on the things that we really, really want to focus, like stealth addresses, um, uh, coin shuffle, things we've been kind of promising to our biggest fans for a very long time. We've added HD wallets, as you mentioned, and Tor support, but the other things it just kept getting delayed and delayed. So about the time that I became product manager, which they actually ended up making me the wallet product manager instead of the whole company, I had a thought that it would. we have a lot of requests for third-party uh, support into our wallet from businesses all the time, at least two to three times a month. Most of the time we have to say no. So if we were to actually change the wallet into uh, a plugin API based system, like a platform uh, where anybody can very easily add their own uh, service without us having to sit down and do it for them, uh, then that would actually free up time for us to work on the things that we do want to work on. Uh, at the same, I mean, Bitcoin, there's developments in it having 
coming out constantly. All the stuff that I'm talking about with coin shuffle and stealth addresses is like a year old at this point. Now we have segregated witness and uh, possibly confidential transactions and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I'm sure that'll be enough to keep us busy. Uh, at the same time, the really big nice benefit was being able to be a third party kind of a plug-in platform is that uh, while we don't have to worry about kind of developing it ourselves, uh, just like we do as Coinopold, Kashila, and others, we can charge revenue sharing or licensing fees to these third-party companies to use our wallets uh, for their services as well. Uh, and the, the plan is to work it kind of like uh, how the App Store or Google Play does, where if you want to provide a free service, we're only happy to host you for free because it'll just give more uh, options to our customers. And if you want to... Uh, try to earn money through it will be taking a very small percent of that too. Nothing major crazy like Apple or Google, but a little bit. Yeah, sure. A business is a business. You know, we don't run charities. We run businesses. Entrepreneurs need capital to continue to build. That's for sure. Um, I know that there had been a lot of talk about how do we monetize Bitcoin wallets? This has been a difficulty and a, and a source of almost like frustration that I've seen from most of the major Bitcoin wallets. You guys now offering third-party plugins, people to come in and start plugging in different features or services in the crypto finance space, this could be the answer. I mean, I, I believe you've tried the donation model before, maybe a premium subscription or something. You know, have any of those worked? And is this, is this where you see the future of Bitcoin wallets going? We had donations, but uh, they really didn't pay much. I think at most we made maybe $100 a month, but considering we spent thousands of dollars in just salaries alone, they wouldn't really cover it. Actually, for a while, um, Google even um, blocked our app for almost two weeks. I remember that. According to them, if you want to have donations, uh, you have to be registered as a nonprofit entity. Right. So that didn't work out too well. Ads, we just kind of don't really want to get into ourselves too much. Uh, be, well, maybe not yet. When we have third-party plugins, maybe we'll advertise some plugins on there for an extra premium or something. But uh, generally, we're not really big fans of ads in general. Plus, they make the wallet look bad, and they might also add some um, security issues too. Right. right. So you don't want to have access to something else drawing on your screen. Other ways to monetize, uh, there's a suggestion of like charging a fee for every transaction. So every time you send a transaction, a portion goes to the miners, a portion goes to the wallet developers. Mm -hmm. uh, that model has failed quite a bit too because uh, mm -hmm. there's so many wallets out there that it'd be extremely easy for anybody to just switch to something else. Right. Yeah, and this is a very interesting idea, basically offering a platform. You're not, you're not selling a service. I mean, yeah. yes, you're selling your own wallet, but... It's free. You offer the wallet for free. So you're allowing people to come in and build really awesome stuff. I can't wait to see what's built. I mean, look at all the amazing apps that we have on the Google Play Store, the Apple App Store. You know, I mean, there's so much stuff for free. It'll be very interesting to see what type of freeware is available to just hook in and add some little functionality. You know, who knows what it's going to be. And then other premium types of of additions, maybe you pay $1.99 or you pay 1% of whatever tr volume that you put through the wallet using this app that gets added into it. What types of apps do you expect to work best? What, where is the demand right now? What, what are you seeing people looking for? Or are you leaving this up to the individual developer, third-party developers? Uh, well, first of all, thing also to mention this whole wallet, not only is it going to be free, it's going to be entirely open source as well. Um, there's going to be no restrictions on the code. Uh, the reason we're going to be able to make money off of it is because while some exchange can grab the code and make their own version of the wallet, if they want to have access to all the third-party plugin app store, they have to go through us. So that's how we're going to keep that secured without relying on any kind of uh, intellectual property crap. Mm -hmm. um, Regarding what kind of apps, uh, well, the most obvious will be things like exchanges. So you can buy, sell Bitcoin like we have right now. Uh, we are planning on having uh, day trading capabilities built into the wallet too. So if you're bored, you can just kind of play with it uh, someplace, day trade during your free time. Um, yeah, I could see some like charting apps coming in, like some really definitely. professional looking charting apps. Uh, the charting, we actually plan on having that as part of the exchange API. So if an exchange wants to provide its own charge, uh, charts, I'll be able to do as well. Um, since I am a 
financial analyst by trade. Uh, and we do plan on using this to target uh, businesses. The idea is to be able to run your personal finance or business finance directly from the wallet as well. So we will initially have things like being able to schedule invoices, pay invoices, track your spending income, uh, profit revenue, stuff like that. Uh, some of the apps that we think will work with that is for U.S. customers, you might have something that will calculate uh, your profit and taxes automatically or uh, something that will schedule some invoices in some special way for a business. Um, also, our personal, um, one of our personal products, Mycelium Swish, it's a merchant app for accepting payments for restaurant food or Mycelium Gear, which is a, a payment platform for accepting payments through kind of like BitPay. And we expect to have some of that built into the app as well, so you can use your phone as a point of sale terminal or as a restaurant terminal. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm I'm really excited about this. I mean, as soon as I heard about the crowd sale, Demetra, I think I reached out to you the same day to try to set up an interview. Let's talk about the crowd sale. Mm-hmm. Walk me through the idea behind the crowd sale. This is something that, I mean, we see DAO just raising $120 million. The crypto space is seems to be very fertile for a crowd sale just because the ease of obtaining the, the Bitcoins and sending them, you know, you don't need anyone's permission. You don't have to send a wire. It's, it's pretty anonymous, although I think you guys required me to uh, put my email address in before I could buy some of the crowd sale tokens. It, it doesn't but, have to be your email address, just an email address you could... <laughs> Yeah, the only thing we care about is a token. Right, right, right. Yeah. So what, when did you guys like figure out, like, yes, we're going to actually crowd sell this? How's the crowd sell going? And what are you most excited about to use some of those funds towards uh, building the Mycelium platform? I'm not sure exactly when the idea for the crowd sale happened. Uh, what happened was a couple of weeks ago, or well, about a month ago, I was told to that uh, they needed me to come to our office in San Francisco to discuss some business. And when I showed up, they kind of dropped us like, hey, we're going to do a crowd sale and it's going to start this upcoming weekend. So I found out about it on Tuesday. That's when I published the uh, press release and they were building everything up right there and then pretty much up to the last minute. The crowd sale itself, technically you're buying uh, stock appreciation right contracts which to prove ownership, we are selling them as tokens, as colored coin tokens. Right. You do get a legal contract granting you the rights to the stock appreciation right. With the token, the only uh, the token address is part of that contract or the Bitcoin address that paid for it. This way we can sell like a stake ownership in a company without having to issue a security. And the only thing we need proof from you in order to give you the right to any valuation of the company is basically you need to either sign, I mean, send the token to a specific address or sign a uh, message with a Bitcoin address where it's stored. Right. Who makes a good investor in this? What is somebody actually investing in? Are they investing in the the profitability of mycelium or are they paid dividends or, or is it just the, the more people that use mycelium, somehow the value of this token will rise or what are people buying into? We already have an established uh, third-party market where we have a lot of uh, support from, as you mentioned, Coinopold, Lux, Kashila, Glidera, Trezor, Ledger, with more coming. So we think that we can actually start making money with this wallet. We have the idea, we have the plan, we already started work on it. Also, that uh, this kind of a platform, uh, there's really only room for maybe one or two of these kind of things in the market. Because if you think about it, there's Google Play and Apple App Store. And the only reason there's two is because there's two incompatible OSs out there. But there's one eBay, there's one Amazon, uh, there's one Airbnb. There's a lot of competitors, but most of the time they're pretty much irrelevant. Uh, so this kind of a platform has a very strong network effects. It also has a very strong um, lock-in, customer lock-in effects. Like if you uh, buy software or an app for a specific uh, type of a platform, it's really hard to just abandon it and go someplace else and buy something else again. I mean, that's why Microsoft had so much uh, lock-in for a long time because people would buy their Windows, they'd buy their Office and all their other applications, and if they want to switch to something else, none of that would work. We believe that we are in an extremely strong position to actually start earning a lot of money. The idea was that we would sell the initial 5%, very small part, of undilutable shares only to the Bitcoin community. 
our biggest supporters, uh, like as we had in a little press release, it'd be like to our supporters, to the anarchist friends, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, afterwards, we're going to be raising more and more money, like professional VCs and stuff, where we actually go public with this. And this would be, uh, at first, it'll be a 20% dilutable shares. But the first 5%, uh, there were initially, like now that we know that where we're going and that we are might be making some money we wanted to offer to our biggest users and supporters a way to uh, profit from that I guess and regarding how they'll be profiting or making uh, many making any income initially this is just an appreciation right so anytime company grows in value uh, this would be from uh, as uh, like subsequent sales of shares or any kind of revaluation events Um, Anytime it increases in value, these investors will be able to claim that increase in value for themselves, which they can either leave as invested as cash in the company or they can pull it out as cash. If we do actually end up making a profit, the plan is to convert these uh, tokens into actual dividend paying shares as to or stocks uh, sorry assets as, as to what form they'll be in whether it'll be an ipo where we sell them as shares publicly traded or whether it'll be something else that's more crypto i'm not entirely sure we don't know what your addiction will be in and we don't know how much money we make but for now it's we have we get these tokens those are our, our rights you know we can prove that we own these tokens if mycelium starts making money and can, continues to do a really good job at creating an awesome wallet then the value of these tokens will appreciate as the overall valuation of the company appreciates. Is that the idea? Correct. So uh, if the company, well, the tokens themselves will trade freely on the market too, so they'll probably grow in value as well. The actual token is uh, really just a contract. It's like a really, really expensive piece of paper, uh, which we ourselves will value as just an expensive piece of paper for whatever you paid for it. But let's say the company next time it sells and the valuation doubles, um, whatever you pay for your token, you can also request that same amount to be paid directly to you in cash. And by cash, you mean like Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency? So you basically prove that you're the owner. Uh, we send the cash and we mark this token as reduced back down to like the cash has been dispersed. Oh, right. I see. If you never pull out the cash, and let's say you buy 1% of the whole company, uh, the valuation growth will continue growing to where you'll always be entitled to 1% of the company. The the growth cash amount plus your token together will be equal to that. So mm-hmm. if we ever do convert to like uh, a share of the company or something, then you can just convert it exactly one-to-one for a 1%. And how have you found the crowdfunding to be going so far? Who's How much interest have you had? Are you meeting your, your goals? We, yeah, at first it was uh, quite a headache because this whole kind of a backwards way of doing this stuff where instead of selling a share that just grows and on its own, we're doing the stock appreciation right that by itself doesn't grow but gives you rise to this growth. A lot of people found that really confusing. So we had to do a lot of, well, I had to do a whole lot of explaining of how this actually works, what you're actually getting. That you have to Yeah, because this is very new. This is, some, this is a new way of financing a company. I mean, and w- through tokens and crowdsourcing. I mean, it's... The tokens and crowdsourcing is new itself, but this stock appreciation right contract, I, I have a bachelor's and master's in business and corporate finance. I've never even heard of these things before. So I had to learn about it myself too. And the reason we're doing it this way is probably obvious to Liberty entrepreneurs, but yeah. So at first it was a little rough. People were asking all these questions that really didn't seem like right. Like for instance, uh, we reserved the right to buy the token at the exact same price you paid for it on May 18th, which is like, so what? I make nothing of it. But now I have to explain that now the token is just an expensive piece of paper. It's the right that actually attached to it that grows. Right. Uh, but. Yeah, after a while, it picked up quite a bit. Uh, as more and more people started to understand it, it, we raised quite a bit of money. And at this point, um, uh, we're also at first a little worried about um, doing what happened with Ethereum, where it just got way overvalued. And then people like, yeah. well, all this money, and what the heck are you going to do with it? So uh, we did have a cap uh, internally set. Um, then we ended up publishing it, making it publicly. Uh, the current cap for 5% is 7,500 tokens. Uh, at this point, we have over 2,000 Bitcoin invested directly. There's also been some uh, private talks and investments uh, with some of the um, 
kind of our closer business partners that uh, our CEO talked to who wanted to invest directly without having to go through, I guess, the more public process. So overall, I think we are actually getting really, really close to our cap, but we won't find out until tomorrow when this ends. Yeah, I think it's great. You guys are really pushing the envelope forward on how to crowdfund and how to show asset ownership from a crowdfund. You're just not crowdfunding something because you think it's a great idea, maybe a Pebble watch or something like that. Yeah. You're, crowd, you're crowdfunding something you believe in, but you're also getting something back. So it's a crowdfund and an investment at the same time without having to IPO or deal with any of that, that stuff. Right. Yeah, that's really the only reason I support it. I'm not really a big fan of altcoins, I guess, or uh, some, if they actually have a specific use, uh, I they would have kind of a sort of use. But a lot of these crowd funds seem like you're investing in a token that's not really uh, ownership of anything. It's just uh, here's a coin that's based on how well this company will do. And then a lot of the growth is speculation. Whereas in this, we're actually selling actual stake in the company. So it's a direct stake. Which is more confusing, the uh, mycelium crowdfunding or the DAO crowdfunding? I'm still not entirely sure what the DAO is about, actually. I, I don't know if, I mean, I haven't had a lot of time to look into it. So maybe that's why. But um, yeah, I'm not sure. It's insane how much money it has raised. And it's like an investment vehicle of some sort. I didn't participate in the DAO. I may look back, you know, five, 10 years from now and like kick myself, but yeah, it's, it's just amazing. It, it's on top of Ethereum, right? Yeah. I'm right wondering if Ethereum. it's uh, a, maybe worth more than Ethereum itself or would that be a problem? I'm not sure. Yeah. It seems like a colored coin of Ethereum. I mean, kind of like Augur, I guess. Which I mean, is, imagine uh, if Ethereum itself was worth uh, the total market cap of Ethereum was, say, 70 million, but the DAO, which runs on top of it, is worth 120. That would be kind of a weird flip. I don't know if that's the case, but yeah. Dimitri, I really appreciate you coming on. I'd like to end here with the freedom segment. We are Liberty Entrepreneurs. We've been talking mm -hmm. a lot about the entrepreneur side of it, but this show tries to help people get the perspective of how entrepreneurship and building actually creates freedom in the individual's life. Because if you're not free, of course, you can't help other people be free. You can't give something you don't have. How has entrepreneurship impacted you and provided more freedom and control in your own personal life? very lucky to work for this company because here everybody is an independent contractor we don't have employees uh, it's a really good team that works like employees but everybody's free to do what they want um, you get paid by for your job uh, everybody works from home uh, we just collaborate with email and Skype and uh, it pretty much lets, gives everybody freedom to work on their own time wherever they want to the thing I really like is it gives me a lot of control over what I want to do with specific projects. So instead of like uh, just riding the ship, I'm actually kind of steering the ship, you know, captain of industry or whatever. Right. Uh, and it gives me a lot of freedom to do, uh, I guess, whatever I want to in my personal life as well. Uh, a lot of free time. Uh, I can travel because it doesn't matter where I'm at for the work. Uh, and Start a beehive started yeah i just started a beehive i'm learning how to fly an airplane um right but a lot of stuff yeah and also with uh the payments being bitcoin you spend them anywhere you want to in the world basically so just take all your money travel wherever you want to work wherever you want to it sounds like a lot of freedom to me you know this digital yeah. nomad type of life is is become a reality in the last decade or so um, and a lot of people like you and, and like myself, you know, I work from home on a computer all day. I can pick up and travel at a coffee shop or go to Asia or Panama or wherever I would like yeah. to go. And it just, it gives you just so much more control, not only over your everyday life. I, I get to pick what time I want to get up. How long do I want to work? It's very entrepreneurial and it's mm -hmm. very free feeling to, like you said, steer your own ship. Uh, Dimitri, it's been such a pleasure having you on the show today is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to add in here any advice for young entrepreneurs any uh tips or tricks or contact information that you'd like to share yeah what i've learned is that uh, as i say uh it's not what you do it's who you know to a point it kind of is uh also what you do um like the way that I got here is uh, building up networks, uh, building up an extremely strong bulletproof reputation of being extremely ethical and trustworthy. 
Uh, so the more you do that and the more people you meet, even if you're not doing anything, just go to meetings, uh, go to conferences, your face gets recognized, you'll figure out what the heck, where your niche is, you'll start developing it. And then by then people just know who you are, know what you do, know they can trust you, and it'll be fairly easy to slip into kind of anything that you want. Like I said, at this point, I, I hire myself for positions that I want to be in. I love it. <laughs> and he goes, I mean, create your own job, build your own freedom, right? Mm-hmm. Dimitri, if someone wants to get in touch with you, is there any contact information or contact information for Mycelium? Uh, info at mycelium.com would be the overall if you want to contact all of us, including myself. Or if you want to contact me personally, be uh, rasa at mycelium.com. That's R-A-S-S-A-H. Or if you just search rasa online, you'll probably find me pretty much everywhere and that, that'll be me. Uh, so today, you know, we're recording this on May the 17th. Tomorrow, your crowd sale ends on May 18th. Uh, mm-hmm. I really wish you guys all the best. Uh, I will definitely be keeping up and following what you what you do. I've used Mycelium on my phone for years now. I love it. I highly recommend everyone go download a copy of Mycelium and open it up. Start sending Bitcoins with it. Use it to store your Bitcoins. There's a ton of security features, awesome plugins, and it sounds like it's just going to get better. So... Dimitri, thank you so much for coming on the show. I I really appreciate it. You're definitely a Liberty Entrepreneur. Thank you for having me. You just listened to Liberty Entrepreneurs, episode 34, How to Create a Profitable Bitcoin Wallet with our guest, Dimitri Muraschek. Let us know what you think. Tweet at us at Liberty E Podcast. And until next time, keep building freedom.